Today we are joined by Fabio Michienzi from BCM and Partners to discuss the Chinese economic situation. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for hosting me, Alex. So tell me, China is facing a slowdown of growth with commodity prices falling and a decline in asset classes. However, there is still an influx of foreign investment. Could Chinese bonds still be a good fixed income investment? Well, that's a very good question, Alex. Uh, in fact, as you say, the commodity cycle is uh, slowing down visibly. And China, that was behind uh, this, uh, it was the growth engine, basically, is no stranger to this uh, change of velocity. If you think of 1.4 billion inhabitants, uh, most of them were living in the countryside at the time uh, with basic needs. And since then, there's been a huge migration towards the coastal cities, uh, which has generated uh, unlimited needs. And this, uh, this movement uh, has uh, lured uh, lots of uh, Western firms uh, into this uh, never-ending market. Now, since then, uh, uh, clearly, the uh, the growth has been uh, slowing down and uh, the historic attraction that China was uh, having uh, both towards uh, uh, domestic and foreign investors seems to be waning. If you see uh, now a few graphs, we can uh, see that uh, uh, the, the efficiency that has peaked and now is reducing. Uh, that. Uh, the investment to GDP ratio that was mainly driven to fill the gap in infrastructure could not be sustained of the, over the longer period. So since uh, 2010, this has reached a ceiling and now is slowing down. Whilst at the same time, uh, whilst uh, uh, the, the domestic credit outstanding uh, was uh, quite constant until 2008. Since 2009, this has spiked dramatically and this is due to the, to the behavior of state-owned enterprises. Now, the both uh, financial, uh, uh, well, the Chinese economists uh, and the authorities, uh, and they know pretty well this phenomenon and they've been uh, trying to face them uh, with, a, with a bunch of reforms. Uh, if we see, uh, if we look at the official uh, data uh, at the moment, they still uh, show a very strong trade surplus and foreign direct investment inflows. However, we have seen that tonight uh, the uh, Popular Bank of China has cut interest rate uh, on a surprise move. And I would tend to see this uh, as uh, almost a desperate attempt uh, to try and uh, stimulate uh, uh, exports uh, through a lower, uh, a lower currency and uh, to try and resolve uh, the real estate overrun. And this may be done at the expenses of the credit overrun that is all over. So if we see now the, what is the trend in foreign direct investment? Uh, we see that the inflows are still powerful, but there is uh, a dramatic downtrend. And uh, it seems uh, as if uh, uh, foreign investors have lost faith into the, the, the sustainable growth of China. And this is also true and very worrisome for, um, um, for, for Chinese uh, wealthy individuals whose fortune is uh, very often interrelated uh, with uh, Chinese companies, sometimes in a marky way. And uh, they seem to be losing themselves confidence uh, in China in the possibility of providing them uh, with this sustainable growth, at least for their own perspective and they are investing more and more abroad. So in order to answer to your question, is there still value in the Chinese bond market? Uh, I would tend to say yes, but. And the but is uh, a big one. Uh, and uh, one has to do a thorough uh, due diligence uh, work before investing uh, and uh, to, to, to handpick these carefully selected bonds in a potentially very dangerous uh, universe. Shadow banking has been blamed for the current issues. Do you agree? And what are the potential risks in the marketplace? Whenever you say shadow, you immediately think of something that is marky. And it is particularly true for shadow banking. It took a long time for the investment community to fully realize uh, the concentration uh, on investments that was uh, around shadow banking in China. Because uh, three main sectors have benefited from uh, the majority of the shadow banking. And these uh, three sectors are interrelated. They are mining, real estate, 
and infrastructures. So whenever you say concentration, of course, uh, uh, what br springs into mind to me, it's an accrued risk. So uh, if we consider now uh, what is happening on the real estate market, it is the one that, that brings more concern nowadays. Uh, we see that the floor space sold is uh, far below the floor space uh, started, uh, which is gapping quite dangerous. At the same time, the price uh, of the floor space uh, in the 70 biggest cities has reached uh, dangerous uh, negative territory and is still uh, trending downside. And uh, if we now look at how this floor space uh, is divided, uh, we see that only a very tiny fraction is uh, what is called uh, tier one, which is primary location. Now, the real estate cycle is a long-term cycle. And uh, why we concentrate on un understanding what is tier one, tier two or below. Because uh, if we look at the next graph, we will see that uh, uh, only tier one uh, space uh, on average uh, sells uh, in approximately two years. Uh, whilst uh, anything that is tier two or lower on average uh, takes uh, 10 years plus to rotate. So uh, this, uh, this credit overhang and this real estate overhang in China is clearly uh, fought by the authorities. Uh, and my hope uh, is that uh, th their measures uh, will uh, be successful in uh, channeling out of the red zone uh, the, this sector of the economy in particular and uh, to avoid any other major bubbles uh, to explode and to be contagious for the rest of the economy. Thank you for your time today, Fabio. Alex, it was very interesting to meet you. We'll be keeping an eye on the changeable Chinese market here at Dukascopy TV. Goodbye.